January 1st, 1975, Penn State Nittany Lions are once again Cotton Bowl champions. Penn State's fourth major bowl bid in four years was a hard-earned reward. It came to a squad of players and coaches who would settle for nothing less than success. All the way, it was a team effort. Late in December, as Penn State landed in Dallas for the Cotton Bowl, each player and coach would take particular pride in the long journey that brought them here. 1974 was to be a rebuilding year. 13 starters were gone from 1973's undefeated team, including three All-Americans and a Heisman Trophy winner. In the spring, Coach Joe Paterno had said, we aren't going to dominate or overpower anybody. We're going to have to work hard to be competitive. But 1974 turned into one of Joe Paterno's most gratifying years in the Nittany Valley. He and his staff took a young, very coachable group of athletes and guided them through a highly successful season. Along the way, there were six key games that shaped the destiny of this constantly improving team. When it was over, the Lions had matured enough to be ranked as one of 1974's top college powers. The first crucial game of the season found Penn State entertaining Stanford. Riding a 12-game win streak, the Lions unveiled a multiple offense that completely surprised the Cardinals. Putting backs in motion kept the visitors off balance and fullback Tom Donchev scored the season's first touchdown. But Stanford quarterback Mike Cordova set a Beaver Stadium pass completion record with 23, two for touchdowns, and with five minutes to play, Stanford was ahead. For Penn State, there was time for one do or die drive. Nobody felt the pressure of this clutch situation any more than senior quarterback Tom Schumann. I think that final drive in the Stanford game uh, gave the team a lot of character and pride in themselves. I mean, you know, we were down with maybe four minutes left in the game, and uh, we needed a score to win it, and we took the ball 80 yards. First and 10, Penn State at its own 20-yard line. Schumann takes to Ace, he drops back, fires over the middle to Dan Natale for a first down at the 38-yard line. Lions on the move, trailing by three. Less than five minutes to play. Here's Schumann. He wants to pass again. Plenty of time. Good protection. Looking, looking. Dumps it out on the right flat to Walt Addy. Addy's at midfield. Steps out of bounds, I believe, at the Stanford 48. Another first down. Schumann straight back. Flips out to Donche. Blockers in front of him. Donchez at the 40. The 35, the 30, and down. Those couple plays were big plays, and it got everybody up, and you know, I developed some momentum, and that's what we needed. First and 10, Stanford 27. The give to Woody Petchel follows Donchez. He's at the 25, struggles to the 20, and dives to the 19-yard line. Second and two, about three and a half minutes to play. Schumann hands to Donchez. He's got the first down and bullies his way to the Stanford 13-yard line. The Lions need a touchdown. Schumann fakes to Petchel, looks in the end zone, throws for a button check, incomplete. Interference call on the Cardinals, and that'll give State first and goal at the one. Schumann gets the pressure behind Anche, spinning, twisting, he's in for the touchdown, and Penn State takes the lead. I'd say overall, you know, everybody just wanted it, and we took off, and we knocked it in. An unforgettable comeback before a national television audience that laid the foundation for 1974. A week later, in the rain and mud, the 13-game win streak came to an end. Navy wrecked Penn State's hopes for a second consecutive unbeaten season. Joe Paterno would now find out if this team could pick itself up after disheartening setback. Like most of his teammates, 
Tom Donchez remembered the mistakes of the Navy loss. The veteran fullback knew the importance of coming back strong at Iowa. We just came off a terrible loss to the Navy, where um, I think a lot of us lost com confidence in ourselves. And we had to regain our confidence in the Iowa game. We went there, and our defense held the, their offense without a first down for the first three quarters. And we put 27 points on the board, so I think that helped us a lot. So devastating was the Lions' defense that Iowa did not get past its own 40-yard line until early in the fourth quarter. It was a brilliant display of team defense, continually giving the offense good field position. It didn't take long for Tom Schumann and company to deliver. A perfectly executed screen to Donchez caught Iowa off guard. Then the senior fullback followed the blocking of Tom Rafferty and Jack Bayronis, and the Lions had scored enough points to win. Rusty Boyle, playing after injury sidelined Walt Addy and Woody Petchel, led all runners with 76 yards. And sophomore Dave Stutz, number 49, formerly a tight end, scored two touchdowns to cap a display of versatility and power. In the second key game of 1974, Penn State proved it could come back from an upset and dominated Iowa 27 to nothing. The Lions continued to improve. A 21 to 14 victory over Army, highlighted by Randy Sidler's clutch catch. A 55 to nothing shutout of Wake Forest. And a 30 to 14 win over Syracuse lifted the blue and white to five and one, returned them to the top 10, and set up the important second half of the schedule that would determine the success of this team. It took a bruising effort by the defense in the third key game of 1974 to quiet explosive West Virginia. Dave Graff and Greg Buttle. Jim Rosecrans and John Kern. John Bush. Chris Devlin. Greg Murphy and Buddy Tesner. Kurt Ellerman. All produced one of the Lions' top defensive achievements of the season. Mike Hartenstein literally flew in to recover a West Virginia mistake. And Tom Schumann knew it was important to strike quickly. Wide receiver Jerry Jerram took the pass on the run and just wouldn't be stopped. And Schumann figured that one was worth celebrating. The senior quarterback from Pottstown hit 9 of 14, including this one, to the Lions' top runner of the day, Woody Petchel. Sophomore fullback Dwayne Taylor scored his fifth touchdown of the season. State held an arrow 14 to 6 lead, and again the defense took charge. Jim Bradley leaped in the path of a Mountaineer pass, while linebacker Greg Buttle roamed from sideline to sideline, stealing two passes. Buttle's one-handed job gave the Lions six turnovers, but one unforgettable play totally stunned the Mountaineers. West Virginia blocked the state field goal attempt, then touched the ball beyond the line of scrimmage, making it a free ball. Ron Coder, number 65, quickly fell on it for six points. The unexpected has become normal for this rugged series between Penn State and West Virginia. Ron Coder's alert recovery ensured a 21-12 victory. It was the 19th straight year the Mountaineers have been unable to beat Penn State. Another big game, the second largest crowd in Beaver Stadium history, and Penn State put its six and one record on the line against dangerous Maryland. The Terrapins were undoubtedly the best all-around team the Lions would face during the regular season. 
State would have to continue to play aggressive football to keep the pressure on, to make things happen. Early in the duel, this philosophy brought results. Starting in place of injured Jim Bradley, defensive halfback Jeff Hyde took a chance. It was a gamble that paid off. Hyde raced 79 yards untouched. The junior from Pittsburgh thrilled a regional television audience and left the Terrapins in a state of shock. In the second period, Maryland showed its big play ability, and now Penn State fans were a bit uneasy. But Tom Schumann regrouped the Lions, and they rammed a 79-yard drive right at the heart of the Maryland defense. The payoff came when Schumann waited to the last split second and then fired to Dick Barvinchak. Penn State led by a touchdown and kicked off to the Terps. Again, alert football made a difference. When Maryland tried a lateral on the kickoff return, Jeff Height read the play perfectly. Height went 21 yards, and the Lions had scored 14 points in seven seconds. Beaver Stadium went wild. After another Terrapin touchdown, State's defense dominated the game. Murphy, Quinn, and Hartenstein, the meanest men on the whole darn line, spent much of the second half in the visitors' backfield. They sacked Maryland's quarterback six times for minus 62 yards. It was a thrilling 24-17 victory over Maryland that ensured Penn State of its 36th consecutive non-losing season. For the second time in 1974, a fullback option pass upset the Lions. This time, it was at North Carolina State, but the narrow loss didn't prevent the Cotton Bowl from inviting Penn State to Dallas on New Year's Day. After celebrating at home by whipping Ohio University, Penn State had one more regular season game. It had special importance, recalls co-captain Jim Bradley. I like the Pitt game. A lot of my friends play for Pitt, and they were so talkative before the game that they were going to kick us here and there and we had nobody and nothing and we just kept our mouths shut and played the game you know the first half it was close it was seven six and i think the experience of our team being in the bigger games had helped us and we just kind of took it to in the second half and it was really a lot of fun when i could walk off the field in the fourth quarter with time left with no worry that we weren't going to lose it was a lot of fun chris barr set a school record with four field goals one of them 50 yards then, after trailing at halftime, the Lions took charge. Jack Behrunis and Jeff Gleamer gave Schumann time to pick out Tom Donchez. To keep the drive moving, Donchez blocked, and Schumann found Dan Natale. Again, plenty of protection from Mark Thomas and Jeff Fleemer. And Schumann went all the way to Jim Acey for the game breaker. 
The combination proved a good one. With John Nestle riding a Panther right out of the play, Schumann threw 35 yards again to AC. While the offense was rolling, there was another key factor, according to Jim Bradley. Well, the defensive line had an excellent game, especially Mike Hardenstein and, and Greg Murphy, Dennis Smudgen, and John Quinn. They just played excellently, and it gave the defensive in secondary a lot of time to react on passes, and Pitt didn't complete very many, and, and with that extra time, it gives us more time to make the big play. Buddy Teston had a big interception. Uh, they started dropping the ball because they had hearers coming. Uh, when the line plays that well, it, it helps us back there. I guess my best game was probably the Pittsburgh game. Seemed like I was, uh, seemed like I got in a lot of contacts, and I guess that's what it's all about. Sometimes even two contacts on one snap for number 79. The Cat Quick senior from Bethlehem clenched All-American honors with a great effort on national TV. Even the specialty teams played a major role in the triumph. A shattering hit by John Bush. A loose ball rolling to the end zone. And Tom Williams made sure nobody else got his hands on it. Then, quite a celebration remembers Hall of Fame scholar-athlete Jack Bayronis. To win that game as convincingly and as well as we did when Pitt was such a good team that um, it was really an exciting game. I remember that night we couldn't go to sleep at all. It was just too exciting. I stayed up all night just to enjoy it. Under Joe Paterno, the Lions have yet to lose to Pittsburgh. The regular season was complete. Penn State's defense played consistently brilliant football. No team scored any more than two touchdowns against this tough unit. All-America, Mike Hartenstein, led the charge. Coach Joe Paterno rated the senior tackle as good as any lineman ever at Penn State. A special honor came to Mike Hartenstein when he was named Chevrolet ABC Defensive Player of the Year, winning a $5,000 scholarship for Penn State. Joining Hartenstein was senior Greg Murphy, second team All-America, who thrived on harassing quarterbacks. Now you know you're gonna have to do it if you don't if you don't do it, like maybe your team will lose, you know, maybe the play that you don't get the quarterback, the, uh, it's a touchdown. One of the quickest pass rushers in college football. And sometimes a little too quick. Senior Dave Graff, number 85 and junior Dennis Woodson, number 73, shared a defensive end spot. While the other inside tackle was junior John Quinn, number 90. Super linebackers have become synonymous with Penn State football. Senior Chris Devlin, number 66, although hampered by injuries, showed he could play with the best of them. Buddy Tesner, Jim Rosecrans, Rich Kristen, Keith Zimmerman, Jill Jackson, and Greg Buttle, number 67, constantly made clutch plays. Buttle and all East selection, intercepted three passes, recovered four fumbles, and topped the team with 86 tackles. The young secondary developed with juniors Jeff Height, Mike Johnson, Tom O'Dell, Tom Giotto, gaining from the experience of senior co-captain Jim Bradley, number 17. Together, this defense created opportunity. They went after people. They took chances and made them pay off. As a group, the 1974 line defense made 15 interceptions recovered 15 fumbles, and tackled runners for more than 400 yards in losses during the regular season. The offense, often explosive, was more varied than in recent seasons. With three-year starter Jack Bayronis, number 55, blocking, 
Cornerback Tom Schumann ran an attack that constantly kept an opponent guessing. No one player dominated. Few records were set. Just a group of dedicated young men all contributing to a successful season. Teaming with Bayronis in the trenches was sophomore Brad Benson, number 71. Sophomore George Wiener, number 68. Senior John Nessel, number 61. Senior Jeff Bleemer, number 74. And junior Tom Rafferty, number 72. It was a line that combined skill and determination, giving state's runners plenty of room to roam. Walt Hattie, Rusty Boyle, Neil Hutton, and Dwayne Taylor, number 34, took turns following their blockers to daylight. Junior Woody Patchell, number 20, recovered from a serious knee injury a year ago and developed into a consistent runner. And freshman Jimmy Cephalo showed signs of becoming one of the most exciting runners in Penn State history. Plays like this twisting 39-yard run against Wake Forest helped Cephalo average more than six yards every time he carried the football. The real workhorse of the Lions' backfield was veteran Tom Donchez. A senior from Bethlehem, Donchez led the team in rushing and scoring. Quarterback Tom Schumann finished a brilliant two seasons that saw him become Penn State's all-time touchdown passing leader. Throwing to receivers like Jerry Jarrett, Schumann moved into third place in career total offense at Penn State. Schumann's other talented receivers included Dick Barvinchak, number 16. Three-year starter, Dan Natale, number 89. And senior Jim Acey, whose two touchdowns helped beat Pittsburgh. The punting of Brian Masella, the kicking of Chris Barr and John Rayner, and the specialty team performers, such as Chuck Benjamin, Ron Crosby, Dave Hornfeck, Rich Nechtel, Larry Suey, Gary Peter Kuski, Rich Monty, and Greg Kubis. They were three units united for a team effort. A different name made the headlines each week, but that didn't matter. This was a team devoid of heroes. A squad of young men who won nine, lost two, ranked in the top 10, and had one more big game to play. The team arrived in Dallas, Penn State's seventh bowl bid in nine years under Joe Paterno. These young men had earned some fun. They were a unique group, says co-captain Jim Bradley. I would say this year's team had the most personality of any team I've ever been on. Usually, everybody kind of thinks the same way. And this year's team had a bunch of personalities on it that, that kept us you know, on our toes and laughing a lot. And, and it was a good year, even, you know, even when we lost. I mean, there was no dissension between guys like, you didn't do this or he didn't do that. Or, it was the team lost, and the team will get ready for the next game. And it was a fine year for all of us. That fine year would mount to a climax here on the first day of 1975. The Lions met a team of destiny, the Southwest Conference champion Baylor Bears, who were welcomed to their first Cotton Bowl by Mike Hartenstein. Penn State hit Baylor with as aggressive a defense as the Bears had seen all season. reaction, like this interception by Jim Bradley, kept the Lions close as Baylor chalked up a touchdown and State added junior Chris Barr's field goal. That was all the scoring in the first half. But in the
in the final 30 minutes, Penn State exploded. They took the second half kickoff and confidently marched 80 yards in nine plays. Two Tom Schumann passes to Dan Natale accounted for 62 of the yards. When Tom Donchez slammed in, the Lions had assumed command. The real game breaker followed shortly as Schumann nearly tripped and under pressure connected with Jimmy Cephalo on a 49-yard scoring strike. Schumann, who called the pass at the line of scrimmage, threw for a total of 226 yards, only five off the all-time Cotton Bowl record. He would be named the outstanding offensive player of the game. As sophomore Neil Hutton set up another score, Penn State edged closer to its fifth major bowl victory in seven years, and a total of 85 wins, the best record in America during Joe Paterno's nine years at Penn State. The points came as Jimmy Cephalo followed Ron Coder's block. State's defense stifled both Baylor's ground and air game. Later, Bear coach Grant Taft would say, they took it away from us in the fourth quarter. They had the winning instinct when they needed it. Mike Johnson's theft wiped out Baylor's last hopes of a win. The junior from Steelton is one of six defensive starters, along with five offensive starters, who will return next season. And the 1975 team will have mighty big shoes to fill. This Penn State squad had made itself one of the best in college football. Tom Schumann's touchdown would be followed by Joe Jackson's startling kickoff return, giving the Lions a Cotton Bowl record 41 points. A season mark of 10 and 2. We beat the bar. We beat the bar. Final ranking in the top 10. That ended up right. Through determination, this 1974 team had achieved its success. Yeah. It was a proud coach who praised his team in the locker room. And you are such a good football team right now, only because you stuck together and worked hard, tried to get better, had the character. Some of you guys who didn't get to play as much as you, you should have maybe in other, in other circumstances. You stayed together, stayed with it, and you're a great bunch of people. We're going to miss those 29 seniors, and, and uh, we wish you the very, very best. You've been great to have around here. But for you guys on the left, we're going great practice. next year. <laughs> New Orleans, Louisiana. A day before the Sugar Bowl. In the history of Penn State, they stay up every single minute of every football game, and they're not going to change tomorrow night. Major bull bid did not come easy to this 1975 Penn State football team. It was a young squad, nagged by injuries, facing a schedule that would include three eventual conference champions, six bowl teams, and nine schools with winning records. season started, every member of this team and coaching staff understood the task that lay ahead. They all knew 1975 would be a year of challenge.
The first challenge, the first game. Penn State and Temple brought excitement to football in Philadelphia. Temple's offense exploded for 25 points. The Lions countered with the big play. Rich Motti returned to kickoff 100 yards and left Temple's last defender grabbing air. Junior quarterback John Andrus found his debut suddenly a dog fight. With seven minutes to play, Temple led by five points. The Owls forced a punt. Woody Petchel took over. A dramatic 67-yard run by the senior from Penn Argyle, all the way to the three. Junior Dwayne Taylor added the touchdown. Andrus went to sophomore tight end Mickey Schuler for a vital two-point conversion. Under extreme pressure, the young Lions had fought back and won, 26 to 25. Come on and play, roared the Lion to the Cardinal, and why not? In two previous meetings with the Redbird, the Lion had come out on top. One of the best in the West, the Stanford Cardinals, flew east and bumped into a Penn State team that was ready to prove itself. The running game was awesome, as Dwayne Taylor got 81 yards and six points. Junior Rich Motti scored a pair of touchdowns, as the Nittany Lions tripled the amount of rushing yards they had gained a week earlier. 18-year-old Tom Donovan, following Mark Thomas, number 69, and All-America Tom Rafferty, number 72, sped 61 yards. He became Penn State's first freshman ever to run for more than 100 yards in a game. Senior Chris Barr followed a 55-yard field goal against Temple, with two of more than 35 yards in the Stanford battle. Defensively, the visitors' fine passing attack concerned Joe Paterno. The coaching staff decided to employ a three-man rush, dropping an extra linebacker into the secondary. The move paid off. Four interceptions, including this one by junior Ron Hostetler, kept the Cardinals scoreless for three of the quarters. While the Stanford running game was limited to 84 yards, thanks to plays like this by Rich Kristen. Teamwork has always been a key to a Penn State defense. Intense pressure by Ron Crosby and John Quinn forces another costly mistake. Tom O'Dell's two interceptions sparked the extraordinary improvement this team showed between its first and second games. It all happened in front of the largest crowd in Beaver Stadium history. Penn State Ohio State, a long-awaited matchup of two great universities. The most enjoyable challenge was against Ohio State and playing against Archie Griffin. It was such a, uh, an exciting game, 88,000 people playing against Ohio State. You know, we didn't get blown out or anything. I thought we played a really good game. That's the kind of games you want to be in. That's why I remember it the most. It was all it was supposed to be. Two squads, traditionally powerful, going head-to-head -head and neither willing to give an inch. Chris Barr kicked three field goals 
averaged 40 yards a punt, and put every kickoff into the end zone. Wayne Taylor had his best game ever, running for 113 yards through a tough defense. All-America linebacker Greg Buttle unloaded on anything red that moved, getting a game-high 16 tackles. Just when it appeared the Penn State defense had taken command, a tumbling catch by Archie Griffin shifted the momentum to the Buckeyes. It was a big play in the late drive that Burley Pete Johnson finished. Big Ten champion Ohio State won by eight points. There was, however, enough glory in that game for both teams. We played better than a lot of people thought we would against Ohio State, and we knew we were a good football team, but it was a heartbreaking loss. Uh, we, we thought we had them on the, the end, and they, they came down and they scored, but we came back the next week, and we knew we, 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 knew we were a good football team, and we just had to go out and prove it, and so we just went out and played football against Iowa. John Andrus and Dick Barbinchak struck for 75 yards as Penn State turned to the big gainer. Dwayne Taylor converted the long one into six points. Perfect protection from lineman Rafferty, Brad Benson, and Dave Shukri. And Andrus hit Rich Monty with a 70-yard bomb. Lions were marching to their fifth win over Iowa in the last five years. Defense, outstanding. Attacking with fury. Mike Johnson. The Rons, Crosby and Coder. Pressure like this by Randy Sidler prevented Iowa from completing a pass the entire game. Defensive backs Tom Giotto. Gary Peter Kuski and Tom O'Dell stung the Hawkeyes. To this young team, the triumph at Iowa was extremely important. Not an empty seat anywhere as Kentucky invaded Beaver Stadium for the homecoming game. On this special weekend, the sidelight was fun, but the highlight was football. Hey, now come on, Let's go! Fire it off! Come on, you guys! Get the first! Andrus and Barbinchak were state's most effective weapon. But for the most part, this contest was decided along the line, where force met force where helmets punch and pads crunch, where the roar of the crowd triggered extra effort. In the second period, the Lions got their chance. Come on, oh! Suey scored the game's only touchdown, and you could probably hear it in Harrisburg. Shortly afterward, Chris Barr added his ninth field goal of the season, all of 25 yards or more. Let's go, Bono! 
close all the way. Another challenge for the defense. Narrowed down to the final seconds. Kentucky had to be stopped. Come on, baby, one more. One more, defense. Come on, baby. One more, one more. Fourth and goal at the Lion 10. The defense held. Kentucky could not set foot in the Lions' end zone. The homecoming was complete. Penn State celebrated a hard-earned victory. And looked ahead to a match with explosive and undefeated West Virginia. When West Virginia last beat Penn State, defensive end Dennis Mugin was just a year old. Quarterback John Andrus not even a year old. And flanker Jimmy Cephalo wasn't even born. What about this year? The unbeaten 1975 Mountaineers were rated number one in the East had averaged 35 points a game, had won four in a row, would Penn State be victory number five? The West Virginia followers thought so. The Nittany Lions had other ideas. After John Bush recovered this fumble, Woody Petchel, in one of the finest games of his career, popped out from behind a George Reiner block for eight of his game-high 120 yards. Throughout the game, a reckless Penn State defense made things happen. Gary Peter Kuski separated runner and ball. An alert Ron Crosby claimed it. Penn State's line totally dominated the visitors. And Larry Suey found room for a good game. Tom Donovan broke a tackle. Got help from Ron Argenta, number 59 and the Lions muscled out 372 yards on the ground. The players really felt that this was gonna be a challenging game for us because of the rating West Virginia had gotten. But I think the, the coaches really prepared us well for this game, that game. And, they did everything they had to to, to make it a, a good game for us that we could play the game that we knew how to play. Aggressive defense caused six turnovers. Chris Barr hit on three field goals. And backup heroes like Jeff Height, number 40, created havoc. That's what the coaches had planned for. It was a magnificent team display of both offense and defense against a Mountaineer squad that was to finish the year nine and three. It was Penn State football at its finest. have beaten us in such a long time, but it just felt great to beat them one more time. And I hope we can just keep doing it. A week later, against an improved Syracuse team, two Chris Barr field goals gave Penn State the lead. The Lions added a touchdown on this fake field goal with Dick Barbinchak, the holder, rolling out and passing to tight end Dave Stutz. Another pass to Dave Stutz, this one from John Andrus, sealed the verdict and
and a 19-7 victory at Syracuse. Following a 31-0 shutout of Army, senior defensive halfback Mike Johnson could look with pride on an impressive performance by the defensive unit. It had allowed only two touchdowns in the last five games, a performance the Lions hoped to match in the final weeks of the season. Penn State also had to maintain its fine kicking game. The Lions had one of college football's best kickers, Chris Barr. His kickoffs usually left the playing field. Most of his punts could not be returned, and he holds every Penn State field goal record. Chris Barr was worth, said Joe Paterno, at least a touchdown a game. I think a good team needs a good kicking game. Uh, I don't think I'm ever the difference in a game. I just do my part and everyone does theirs, and if we all do it well, usually come out on top. At Maryland, the kicking game made a big difference. Chris Barr booted two quick field goals, and the Lions led the 14th-ranked Terps 6-0. The Lion offensive line knocked down Terrapins like tenpins, and Woody Petchel went 36 yards to give Penn State an even bigger advantage. It then became a test of endurance. Good old-fashioned, hard-hitting football. The kind that helped co-captain John Quinn win all East honors. And enabled Ron Coder to be a standout. A defense that sent linebacker Jim Rosecrans at the passer and Greg Buttle to the football. It was Rosecrans' best game as he forced two fumbles and made ten tackles. But the Lions couldn't stop the Atlantic Coast Conference champions forever, and Maryland forged ahead. Late in the final period, John Andrus engineered another of those heart-stopping drives. A leaping catch by Dick Barvinchak. And a strike to Mickey Schuler. Set up reliable number 99 from 40 yards out, and the game rested on Chris Barr's foot. was perfect. The field goal gave Penn State a 15 to 13 victory and the Lions celebrated their 21st win over Maryland in 22 games. The very next week there was yet another squeaker. This time North Carolina State was the winner by one point. Final score North Carolina State 15, Penn State 14. Determined to rebound and proudly accepting a bid to play in the Sugar Bowl, Penn State stormed into Pittsburgh. When Pittsburgh comes around, everybody gets so psyched up for that game because everybody wants to, we want to beat Pittsburgh. Penn State wants to beat Pittsburgh. No matter what the Panthers tried, Penn State had an answer. Tackle John Quinn, number 90, played a major role in nullifying the Panthers' high-scoring offense. I felt we played uh, exceptionally well against Tony Dorsett and Elliot Walker from uh, Pittsburgh. Dorsett did have over 100 yards, but statistics sometimes misleading. We contained him, and considering the game he came off the week before, 303 yards against Notre Dame, I thought we did an excellent job. In a contest that had the highest national television rating of any regular season college game in 1975, Penn State's defense proved its superiority. The strategy was plotted perfectly. A flaw had been detected in Pitt's execution of extra point attempts. Tom O'Dell explains. The coaches had seen with the center of Pitt would dip his shoulders and lift up his rear arm right before he snapped the ball. And what I was supposed to do as soon as I saw him do that was just 
go right over the center, just jump right over him. That's exactly what I did. Odell wiped out its only extra point attempt and continued to bother the Panthers kicker. Offense, Steve Geis swerved out of a crowd and took off on a 28-yard go-ahead run. Chris Barr added the conversion and one point separated these two Eastern powers. In the final minutes, a clutch defensive rush led by flying Gary Peterkuski forced a pit field goal attempt to sail wide of the mark. Teammates Greg Buttle and Jim Rosecrans led the Lions celebration as Penn State beat Pittsburgh for the 10th straight year and finished the regular season with a 9-2 record. The challenge of 1975 did not end with the triumph over Pitt. There were personal challenges, often overlooked in a team game but all a part of the desire and dedication of this squad. Co-captain Greg Buttle faced one kind of challenge. He was the latest in a long list of Penn State linebackers to gain national attention. He had tradition to uphold. And how he upheld it. Greg Buttle lived up to all that was expected of him. He became Penn State's sixth All-American linebacker in seven years. Split end Dick Barbinchak faced a different challenge. He underwent back surgery before the season, was not counted on to play. He won a starting job 10 days before the first game and led Penn State in pass receptions. Ron Coder, number 65, an outstanding offensive guard in 1974, faced the challenge of a switch to defense. Learning a totally new position, Coder led the Lions in quarterback sacks as he mastered his new job. Woody Petchel, number 20, thought he might never play football again after a knee injury two years earlier. It was a challenge he worked hard to meet. It was just uh, amazing how the doctor, how he, he, I think he was a miracle worker, kind of, you know, because I really didn't think, you know, I was ever going to be here again. Petchel did play again, led Penn State in rushing and touchdowns. So this team, no stranger to adversity, enjoyed its reward. Joe Paterno's eighth bowl team and fifth major bowl bid in a row. A visit to historic New Orleans and the 1975 Sugar Bowl. It would be the first college football game in the Louisiana Superdome. Eastern champion Penn State and Southeastern Conference champion Alabama. The Tide scored the game's only touchdown in a brutal defensive struggle. All-America Chris Barr kept the Lions close with two field goals. The narrow 13-6 setback did not dim the accomplishments of the Lions' fifth straight season ranked in the top ten. Underclassmen filled many key roles on this young squad like key defensive standouts Gary Peterkuski, Ron Crosby, Randy Sidler, Ron Hostetler, and Kurt Allerman, number 53. On offense, seven of the top eight backs were underclassmen, as were four starters of the offensive line. 
this young team had more than its share of injuries. It faced more winning teams than anybody else in the final top ten. That was the challenge of 1975. Uh, it's hard for me to describe this football team in, the, in, in so far as how many games it won or lost. I think the best way to describe it is in, in terms of effort. This team, I think, played right up to the top of its ability every single football game. They gave 100% effort. It was probably the hardest working team I've been around. It faced the most adversity. They played the toughest schedule we've ever played here at Penn State. It was a team that stayed together when we had to stay together. We had a great mutual feeling between each other. They were 9-3. and three. They have a lot to be proud of. They're a credit to the football tradition we've, we have here at Penn State. We came out of it uh, learning a good lesson, I think, that in order to make a season the way you want it, you have to work at it, and with the coaching that we did have, it, it really paid off, you know, that we got the most out of our ability.